to reach the main point of number theory, which for us is the encryption, the real encryption ciphers that are, are working in, in practice, called RSA. Today, we're going to reach that point. But a quick recap of where we are so far. So uh, we started two tracks. And on one track, this is our main track here for RSA. And uh, this is kind of auxiliary track of how to compute GCD and how to compute the inverse using Euclid algebra, right? Um, so a quick recap. You don't have to rewrite this, because probably in your notes from last time and the time before, but you could write it as a quick recap of where we are. So we're looking for the inverse module plan. And uh, we build this set of powers of A. And we show that if there is an inverse, so we say there is an inverse if and only if, uh, what was the condition? GCD of A and N is 1, right? So they cannot be an inverse unless those are co-prime with each other. And we had the theorem that proved that uh, both ways. If there is GCD1, there is an inverse. If there is an inverse, the GCD must be 1. So how do we prove that theorem? We look at this power set. And we say, well, if you build all these powers, at some point, the powers must be repeating values. Right? Because there's infinite elements of powers. If I keep building the sequence a, a squared, a cubed, a fourth, I get an infinite set sequence. But there's only finite values in Zn. Right? In Zn, there's only n values. So because this starts repeating, we show with a little arithmetics that the moment uh, a at some power u is the same as another power v plus u, the moment those powers start repeating, which must happen, then I get that A of v has to be 1. There was a little proof there that says the moment those powers start repeating, uh, because A and N are co-prime, that will imply A and V has to be 1. If you don't follow that proof, that proof is very important. So it's, it's a, like two lines proof, but you have to know how that proof works. I'm going to say it one more time. How did we prove this theorem? We said build this set of powers. The set of powers is infinite, apparently, but there's only finite number of values, so they must be repeating. If two values, two powers are repeating and they're the same value more than, because A and N are co-prime, they have no prime factors in common. It must be that A and V, that's the difference between the two powers, is one. The moment I show this, obviously I have an inverse. Because if A of V is 1, the previous power must be the inverse. So that proves that I can find the inverse. All right. So then what did we do here? Uh, we looked at a set of co-prime reminders. Those are the reminders in Zn that have GCD equal 1 with that. That's not all of them, obviously. For some ends, there's a lot of co-prime reminders. For n equal prime, almost everyone is co-prime with a prime number. But for n equal something like 12, there's not that many co-primes. Because with 12, 2, and 3, and 4, and 6, and 8, and 9, none of these numbers are co-prime with 12. All of them has common prime factors. Right? So as an example here, what is C12? The co-prime reminders with 12. Who's co-prime? 1 is always there, right? Who else is there? Is 2 there? No. 3? No. 4? 5? 5. Who else is there? 7. Who else? 8? 9? 10? 11? Well, 1 and n minus 1 are always there. So 1 and n minus 1 always in the set of co-primes with that. So you can see in, 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 uh, in C12, I only have four values here, right? And then we say, we're going to call the size of this set phi of n. That's just a notation. So phi of 12 would be what? Four. It's the size of this set. And then we show a very important theorem 
that goes far beyond number theory. It's fundamental to all group algebra. If you, if you study a little bit more mathematics, you get into group algebra, not in this class, not even in the honor section of this class, that says you can actually factorize this set of co-primes, reminders, <coughs> C of n, as PA times a set of co quotients. So we show some examples. You gotta be careful how to pick this set. Every number in here, is a power of a, so every co-prime, let's say c from here, is some power of a times a quotient. But every co-prime can be written as different powers times different quotients, right? And we always pick which version. How do we decide, take a co-prime, write it as a power of a times q. Which q do we like? Hmm? The smallest cube. For example, I could pick in here c equal 5. Uh, let's take a, a equal, um, let's take one of these co-primes, let's say 7, right? And we say, uh, what is the power of a in here? That would be 7. What's the next power? 7 squared is 1. It's 1 modulo. 12. Right, so that's 1. So V in here is 2. So this, I take uh, another co-prime, this C, and I could say, well, I should be able to write this 5 either as 7 times some quotient. It's 7 times what? 7 times what gives me 5? Hmm? What? So in here, I'm, I'm in modulo 12, right? Everything is modulo 12. I'm wondering if there is uh, something I can multiply 7 with to get a 5. 7 times 11, 11 yeah. gives me what? 77. 77 modulo, modulo 12. How much is 77 modulo 12? Right. It's 6, the question is 5, right? So that's 7 times 11. <laughs> That's a possible quotient for me, right? This is a power 7 at power 1 times a quotient. The quotient is this 11. Or I bet I can write this as 7 squared. That's the other power times what? How much is 7 squared? 1. one. So 1 times what gives me 5? <coughs> 5. So now, see, I have... I can write 5 as either 7 at 1 times a quotient or 7 at 2 times a quotient. That's always possible, assuming everything is co-prime. Both 7 and 5 are co-primes here. Um, which quotient I like? Between 11 and 5, which quotient do I pick? Five. The 5. The quotient is the minimum of 5 and 11, so that's a 5. <coughs> that's how we build this set QA of quotients. There's a quotient for every co-prime, but if there's multiple possibilities, we pick the smallest one. And many co-primes will have the same quotient because they use different powers of A. And we had this example last time, and we have more in the notes. So that's how we build this set QA. And then there is a proof of three parts that says this set is the same as this set, uh, meaning there's there's two proofs there. Every element in Cn is also here. That's easy to show because every element has been constructed with a Q, so there is some Q that gives me back that element. But also the other way, which is any way you make a product in here, you end up with a co-prime. The reason is any product of these two values, a power of A and the Q in here, since A has no prime common factors with N, and Q has no common prime factors with them, their product will have no common prime factors with them, which means the product must be a co-prime because it has no common prime factors. That shows that the sets are the same. There is a third proof that says even though the sets are the same, how do we calculate the size of the set? So the last piece is this is the same as that. This bars indicate size size of this, the size of that. That's obviously from here. If the sets are the same, their sizes are the same. 
But there's one more thing which says the size of this product set, meaning this product set is make all possible products between PA and QA. Take every element from here, make a product with element from here. The question is, how big is this set? If I tell you I have three pants and four shirts, and every pant goes with every shirt, how many possibilities are there? How many elements do I get by choosing a pant and a shirt? Three times four. But there is something that needs to be carefully proven or designed for this to be true. The reason that's true, if I have three pants and four shirts, there's 12 possible ways to dress up, right? The reason is true is because every pant with every shirt creates a unique combination. Blue pants and white <coughs> shirt is a combination that can only be produced with the blue pants and white shirt. If I choose the red pants and the white shirt, I get dressed up differently. If I choose the red pants with the yellow shirt, I get different. So the question in here is, is it true that every time you make this product, you get a different combination or a different value? I know most of you seen sets before, and most of you seen Cartesian products before, but I'm pretty sure you haven't seen this idea. <coughs> what if some of these combinations, some pants and a shirt, produces the same way of dressing up? I count something twice now, which is not allowed. That's what we're going to do next two, three weeks, counting. But for now, that's why there's another proof required here that's in the notes that says every time you pick a power of A times a quotient, you get a different value. Like if you pick another power of A times another quotient, let's say Q2, every time you pick two powers of A or two quotients or something different, you cannot get the same value. That's why the product of these three times four 12, it's actually 3 times 4. Okay, that's something we're going to talk about more at counting. When you count possibilities, you got to make sure you don't count the same possibility twice. That may be obvious for pants and shirts. Every pant with a shirt is a new combination, but not necessarily obvious here. You could make a product of this times that, and again, a different product, a different <coughs> element from here with one from here, and get the same value. Like, for example, here, right? We got 7 times 11 is the same as 7 squared times 5. That's the same value. Why this cannot happen in here? The reason is because we always pick the smallest quotient. <coughs> if this would have happened, both 11 and 5 will be quotients in here. But we only pick the smallest one. So this will never happen once we make this product. How many people follow me? Hands up. Okay. I know this is a little bit intense, and that's the most intense thing, the whole course, okay? This theorem right here is the hardest thing we do this <coughs> year. So if you get this one right, bingo, that's it. Everything else, it's easier than that. So there's three proofs here. Why those two sets are the same? And then why the size of this set is actually, can be factorized into two products. That's proof number three in the notes. Now that we have this, everything is easy. Uh, who is the size of Cn by definition? That's P of n. Right? And now who is the size of Pa and Qa? Who's the size of Pa? How many elements are in Pa? V times the size of Qa. The size of Qa is not interesting for us. It's something. That's saying what? P of n is V times K, some K, which means it's a multiple of V. Because it's a multiple of V, we have another theorem. So this theorem right here, this part, is called Lagrange. And this goes beyond number theory. This theorem right here, it's called Euler, <coughs> Euler and, and this is specific to number theory. This theorem in effect says, if that's true, I get what? How, how can I compute A of V of N? It's very easy now. 
because a of e of m is a at v at some power, right? But how much is a at v? <coughs> one. One at any power is? One. And also I get the inverse. a at minus one is a of e of n minus one, right? If a at some power is one at the previous power, must be the inverse. So what is the difference between this phi of n and v? So we know the relation v must be a factor of phi of n. Like I could have in here phi of 12 is 4, but the order of some elements. So v, see, v was 2 for this element, v of a. This is order of a. So what's the relationship? The relationship is that this v must divide p of n, <coughs> p of 12 in this case. Right. What's the difference between p of n and v? They both act at orders, right? a at v equal 1, a at v minus 1 is the inverse. a at p of n equal 1, a at p of n minus 1 is the inverse. What's the difference? I mean, v is much is smaller than phi of n. V is the first value that for which that happens, like a two. Phi of n is a multiple of v. The big difference is this v is different for every a. Remember the recitation last week exercises where I pick a number and I got v equal three or v equal four, and then somebody else went to the board, pick another number, say modulo n and got v equal 12? How many people remember that? And when we did fix an n, but we picked different a's, we got different v's, right? But phi of n is the same for every a, right? So if I pick different <coughs> a's, I could have different orders v's. Uh, let, me, let me just, without proof, put an example of that. Right here, let's do another example. So if n equals 15, <coughs> what is c of n? <coughs> what are the co-primes with 15? 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, okay, so who's phi of 15, number of co-primes? Eight. Eight. That tells me everywhere you pick a co-prime, let's say A equal four, that's gonna have an order, right? There is a power that, the smallest power that if I raise at that power, I get one. But that order has to be a divider of phi of n. So what orders are possible there? Either one, what else is a divider of eight? Two, what else? Eight or four. The possible orders, this theorem tells me the orders must divide phi of n. So they're, they're one of the divisors of phi of n. So let's, pay, let's pick a, a equal four, what's the order? Two. Right? 2 divides phi of 15, right? Well, we can pick another one. Let's say a equal 2. Now, what's the order? What power do I need to raise 2 to get 1? 4. 4. Right? 2 to the 4 equal 1. Again, 4 divides phi of 15. So the difference is the order v is dependent on a. Different a's have different orders, but phi of n is not dependent on a. And phi of n acts like an order for all a's co-prime. There's got to be co the only co-prime numbers have orders, right? So it's got to be a co-prime value. That's the difference between the order and phi of n. Phi of n is like an order, big order for everybody. Right? 
Yes. What? Right, one is all order, it's a possible order only for one value. What value has the order one? <coughs> only one has the order one because race at one, I need to, I get that value and to get one it's only one value. Right? Okay. So that's the story with phi of n, that's where we were last time. Phi of n acts like an order for everybody. Good. And now we are in a much better position to understand RSA. The reason for all this theory is that without it, we can make sense of the RSA equation. So let's, um, let's do that. So um, I want to do two things on RSA. First, I want to do the RSA principle. <coughs> As in mathematics, mathematical equation. And then I want to look back uh, way the way to the beginning of the module at ciphers, how decoding and encoding can work. So I actually want to make it very clear, to, even in your notes. Let's fix in our minds the RSA equation first, and then we talk about encryption and decryption. The RSA equation with our theory, it's extremely easy. This is stuff that the regular section cannot prove, even if they want to. But for us now, we have this stuff. It's trivial. Here's what the RSA equation says. What we want is something like x at a power e, and then again at a power d, which is the same, of course, as x at d, d at e, to be x modulo n. That's what we want. We want this to be true, to have those two powers, E and D, such that if I raise at one of them, then I take the result raised at the other. Of course, that's, that's the same as X at power E, D, right? That, that's what this really means. We want this to be X modulo N. That is the mathematical thing that we need for RSA to work. Now, the way we achieve this, okay, how to get it, we're going to make ED be phi of n times something plus 1. This is the necessary condition, RSA necessary condition. So, with what we have, it's very easy to prove that if E D satisfies this equation, K here is is an integer, right? So this is a, doesn't matter what K is, multiple of P of n plus one. So it's a multiple of P of n plus one. That's the same thing as saying, by the way, that how can I write this in different ways? I could say E D is one modulo phi of n, right? It's the same thing. ED is one modulo phi of n. Or I could write, if I like better, ED phi of n must divide ED minus one. All those things mean the same thing, right? Who's following me here? On, on this condition, yes? One person would be one plus modulo. Multiple of phi of n? No, the one This? Yeah, would be one plus not even. No, no. This is saying if you want a multiple of phi of n, that's the same thing as saying modulo phi of n, ED has to be one. Oh, okay. <coughs> so I don't like this modulo expression here. The book uses it that way, and the people talking about it that way, and it's correct. The reason I don't like this mod phi of n here is that. I get confused between when is it mod phi of n and when is it mod n. It throws me off all the time when I get to add and say, okay, some stuff is modulo n and some stuff is modulo phi of n. How come I have two modulos now? So I never like this mod phi of n here. I never use it. It's true. This means the same like the other things. I like this one. This is how I think of the RSA condition. So I avoid writing it with modulo, so I never get confused when I write RSA mod 
I always do the mod n when I need it, because phi of n and n are not the same thing, right? Phi of 12 is 4. So to avoid this, I really kind of don't like this. I'm going to erase it. It is true mathematically, and many books use that name, but I don't like it. Why now, if this is true, then this is true? That, that's the trick. That's what people want to prove, and they cannot prove without the theory. If E and D satisfy this, P of N at K plus 1, then this is going to be true. For us, this is very easy. How much is X at ED? This. Well, we're going to replace ED with that, right? So what do we get? X at P of N times K plus 1, right? Now, how can I write this? This is x at phi of n, everything at k <coughs> times x, right? Are you guys following me? Phi of n k produces phi of n times k here, right? If I raise at two powers, and times x produces plus one, right? Of course, everything in here, everything is modulo n. Because I, I don't write this, everything I have is modulo n all the time. Now, how much is x at phi of n? 1. That's the Euler theorem here. x at phi of n is 1. So this is 1 at the power k times x, which is x. Yes? Can you explain that one more time? Yeah. So again, this is no, I know it sounds like magic, but it's easy. The trick, the hard part, is this theorem here that says A at T of N is 1. That's the hard part. If you get that, this is just simple calculation, right? Again, X at the power E D, E times D have this property, they are this. Well, how do I write that? E D is P of N times K plus 1. P of n times k, I can write it, so plus 1 is times x, just like regular arithmetic, right? I can take a plus 1 from the exponent and write x on the side. And now phi of n times k, it's x at phi of n, everything at power k. So x at phi of n is 1, that power k is 1, times x, it's x. Now, we are assuming here that x, for the theory to hold, a has to be a co-prime. So let's assume that x is co-prime with n. We'll see that, that that's not a big deal in cryptography. Every x will be co-prime with n very, very easily. Because n will be so big that no reasonable x, a message or something, will be have any chance to have common prime factors with it. How many people follow me here? Assuming we believe this theorem right here, A at phi of n equal 1. Absolutely critical for cryptography, this one. How many people follow this stuff? This is easy, right? It's a simple calculation. This is what makes encoding and decoding possible in RSA. Encoding is E x at E. And decoding is take the cipher at power D that will give me back the original message. The message is x. How do I encode it? I lift it at power d. Everything is modulo n, right? And then how do I decode that? I lift it as a different power, d. And I get back the original message. That's it. Now, this equation's not easy to prove if we don't know this theory. That's, that's the problem. With this theory, piece of cake. OK. So now, let's put this whole story in the context of ciphers. That's what we want. I want to put the whole story here in the context of ciphers. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, you know, cryptography. Crypto means uh, you want to take uh, some sort of message X. That's the original. And when we encode, we get a cipher, 
y. And of course, we got to be able to decode the ciphers to get back what? x, right? The whole point of encoding decoding is to crypto something into a cipher that's hard to break, presumably, and then be able to decode it back to the original. So um, let's, let's look at it as a table. We're going to say here encode. And maybe decode. Um, I hope there's enough space here. And then we're going to say, OK, condition. And maybe we're going to say how, how to break. The first one we looked at was the shift cipher, right? which was saying encoding is the, the cipher is y. It's x plus b mod n. Remember the first cipher was saying, take, pick an n like 26 or 100 or 200, whatever you want, and move on that wheel <coughs> b ticks forward. So if that's my encoding function, what is my decoding function? How do I get x back from y? Y minus, y minus b modulo n. Everybody follows me here. If I add b ticks one way to get back the original message, I have to get b ticks the other way, right? And what's condi there's no condition. It just works. How do I break it? I need to find b. Presumably, n is public in all these things. So n is public. Public list. Publicly known. It's easy to find a b. I won't spend time on this thing, because you can see from ciphers going back and forth to trial, you can find the b. Uh, well, n is not public. The question is, can you do the decoding and encoding? I mean, somebody has to know this n. You got to define who is your adversary, who is he you don't want to find things, and who is the people who you want to decode things. You know, on all this cryptography, n is public usually. But there's some things private that if you don't know those things, you can't encode and decode. So we, we'll get there. Oh, by the way. I think the sheet whose turn is now? This section, maybe? Start from here, all the way to the back, one side, and then the other side. Then we did what? Linear, right? How did the linear work? Y was who? AX plus B <coughs> mod N. So how do we get X back from that cipher? We have to reverse that operation, so that's X minus B. And then, what do we have to do after we take b out from y? How do I get x? I have to multiply with the inverse. Everything is not then, of course. So there is a condition for this to work, for this whole operation to work. It doesn't work for any a and b. What do I need? GCD of A and N equal 1, which is the same as saying there is an inverse. That's the condition I need. That got to be an inverse to be able to reverse this operation. And now I have to find A and N to break it. Now, that's easy. How about in RSA? <coughs> the encoder does y equal what? How do I encode things in RSA? I take x and raise at the power e more than e and n are public. 
everyone can do encodings. Everybody knows E, everybody knows N. I take my message, Virgil is the best teacher in the world. No, just kidding. Okay, that's my message. What do I do with it? I raise up the power E. Everybody knows E. Everybody can do this encoding, okay? And no secret, I do modulo N, and that's my cipher now. How do I decode? I have the cipher. How do I get X out of the cipher? I raise Y at the power D. Remember? That, what we said. Yeah. X at E, D. X at E is the Y, right? So when I raise a power D, I'm going to get back what? The original message. <clears throat> Assuming E, D satisfy this condition. That's the necessary condition for SA. So Y to the D is going to give me back X. D is private. <coughs> Private, they, they, they like this word in cryptography. They really mean secret. So if you, if you don't want to use private, just use the word secret. D, only the person that's supposed to be able to decode the message knows. If I'm in a military and I send you know, a message to the other guy in, in, you know, in Asia, I encrypt the, me the message is something I don't want people to find out. I encrypt it with ENN. Now, even if ENN are public, there is no way to decrypt this unless you know this secret D. That's the magic of RSA. Even though anybody can encrypt anything, to decrypt it, you know this D. You need this D. And D is hard to find. Okay, so what's the condition of RSA? We have it right there. <coughs> ED has to be P of N times something plus one. We just said before, for this thing to work, we need this condition. How to break? You would be an instant billionaire and very famous person if you break out and say, yes. Um, just to <coughs> double check, is it x equals y to the d mod n, or do you not? Is what? Um, for of course, more than everything it is more than. Okay. So. I specifically do not like writing. I could write this equation again as what? E D is what is one modulo phi of n. I don't like that way of writing it because then I have some modulo phi of n and modulo n, and I get lost which ones which. That's why I keep modulo n like before, but I write this this way. Yes. Right. So he asked a very good question. Uh, I think you said it a little bit off, but we all understood what it means. If N and E are public, why is it so hard to find D? Because D is just the inverse of E modulo phi of N. Right? Exactly. So people have banged their heads to this question from for 40 years since a very smart guy, Ronald Rivest at MIT, invented RSA. R stands for Rivest. And you know, people usually list their names alphabetically on a paper. Well, this is not alphabetically because the guy R came up with it. He got the Turing Award for this, which is the equivalent of Nobel Prize for computer science. Because such a simple cryptography schema and so practical that can be implemented with a cellular phone. You don't need a big computer to do this. It's so hard to break. <coughs> That's a great question. Why is this so hard to find D? We'll get there, okay? That's the next half hour. Great, so <coughs> I'm gonna add here that the reason we need this is because we want x encoded, that's y, when we raise it at the power d to be x in d, and we want this to be x modulo n. That is the equation we had here before. We said this has to be back x, and for that to happen, we need ed to be a multiple of e of n plus one. 
very hard. In, in a moment, we, we'll establish what very hard means. But let's, let's do a little preview here without writing anything on the board uh, about what, what he said right, right here. How would you find the inverse? So we need the inverse of E modulo what? To get D. How would you find D? We need the modulo inverse of V modulo phi of n. n it's known. If it would be modulo n, I could use extended Euclid, which is a very fast algorithm from last time, to find the inverse. But it's modulo phi of n. Right? The inverse of, of E that's known, it's not modulo n. It's not n times something plus 1. It's phi of n. And phi of n, it's not known. OK? Phi of n, it's not known. So phi of n, we'll add something here. Phi of n, hard to compute. That's why simply taking the inverse modulo phi of n, not possible, because phi of n, it's not an easy thing to get. Remember, n is public, e is public. Not phi of n. So breaking it is equivalent with finding phi of n, which is equivalent with factorizing n into factors. You know, e at one. Factorization is a known hard problem. It's easy one way. If somebody gives you the factors, make the product, that's easy. But the other way is damn hard. Somebody gives you a number, says, find me the factors. For big numbers, this is a known computational hardship. Even if you had a farm of computers, still, factorizing a number into prime factors, it's a hard thing. And it turns out that knowing phi of n, which is what's necessary to reverse this to get d, the inverse, it's equivalent with, with the factors. Uh, knowing the factors. So before I move on, I want to do a quick example of what I say. Uh, here's an example. Uh, how about n equals 77? Just pick an n. Uh, I'm going to use phi of n. I'm going to tell you from the beginning who phi of n is. Phi of n is 60. And you're going to be like, wow, I just counted so fast the co-primes with 77. Right, that's what phi, phi of seven, sorry, 77 here. Phi of 77 is the co-primes with 77, right? I just told you it's 60. I, I, do you think I just counted in my head like a way? Of course, I have a reason here. There's a much faster way to compute phi of n than counting the co-primes. Whoever looked at home or two. So there's a problem there who tells you that phi of n can be computed faster than simply counting the co-primes. We'll get to there in a second. The, re the way I did it, I said that 7 times 11, right? And this is 7 minus 1 times 11 minus 1. So I said, if n is 7 times 11, I know a magic formula for phi of n. I could have counted the co-primes, like list all the co-primes with 77 and see how many there are. There will be 60. Or I could say, take the 7 minus 1, take the 11 minus 1, 6 times 10, 60. We'll get to why phi of n is that in a moment. So I count the co-primes, and now I pick, for example, E, 13. That's the public key, E. So what do I need? Who is D? How do I get D? I need E times D to be what? I need to be what? 60 times something plus 1. That's the same as saying D has to be the inverse of E modulo 60, right? It turns out I can compute this 
like before we've done inverses, that turns out to be 37. I could use extended Euclid, for example, to get uh, that, right? How many people remember extended Euclid from last time? So I, I, I start with A and B, I do Euclid down to GCD, then I compute these coefficients back up iteratively, and it turns out that the final coefficients are the inverses I need. So we'll, we'll see in a moment that if we do this, we do get 37. And, and just to verify, you always verify, okay? Verify. How much is 13 times 37? Whatever the calculation is, Euclid or not, it's good to do a verification. How much is this value? Anybody with the calculator can tell me how much this is? 13 times 37? Nobody can tell me how much this is. How much? 451, maybe. 451, you say? 481. 481. Oh, yeah. Is it 481? Yes, 481. All right. So how much is this 60 times what? If I take modulo 60, what do I get? Right? So I got the one I need. E and D have to be the inverse of each other, modulo phi of n. I don't like modulo phi of n, but sometimes necessary to write. I like to write it this way. So I have a clear view of what, when it's phi of n and when it's n. n is not 60, n is 77. Okay. So how encryption decryption is going to work in here? This is the setup. Okay. So the setup is up to somebody to design the RSA. How do we get 37? You have to use one of the inverse methods. Either raised to the power, or Euclid extended, or phi of n, or something. So you got to find a way to find this inverse. Now, how the RSA would work? Once I have, I have the following parameters of RSA. N is 77, which is 7 times 11. Phi of N is 60. The public key E, we said it's 13. And the, that's public. And the private or secret D is 37. <coughs> now, how does the encoding, decoding works? A message gets sent to what? When I encode with RSA, who's why? How the encoding works? I raise at E. So that who is E? 13 modulo N. Who's N? 77. That's the cipher. That's the encryption. And when I decode, how do I take this? Sorry, that's x. That's y equal x. I made a mess here. Let me write it again. x, when we encode, we get y, which is what? x at 13 modulo 77. That is the cipher. That is the original message. And when we decode, how do we decode y? What, how do we get back x? We take y and we raise it at what power? That is the private key that only the people who have the 37 can back can get back the original message. Modulo what? 77. So to design an RSA setup, we need this. We need to know n. We need to know the factors. These are really important. Without the factors, if I tell you 77, you can't design the RSA. You need a 7 times 11 to design the RSA. Once we know this, we get phi of n. We get E and D, 
there's a choice on E and D. You can pick different E's that corresponds to different E's. I pick here 13, so <coughs> private QB 37, but I could have picked, I don't know, 23, and then I get a different corresponding private key. And then this is how the encoding decoding works. Once I have all this set up, everybody's going to know what? What do I make public? What numbers are public in here that everyone knows? Yeah. Which are 77 and 13. Anybody can encode messages. Take whatever message you have, raise it at the power 13 modulo 77. That's the cipher. Now, who can decode messages? Only people who have the D can decode messages. Yes. If the N is public and the E is public, what stops people from just finding A of N and doing that? That's what he asked. Yeah. Well, phi of N, if I've had if I've had phi of N, I agree with you because all I need is now the inverse the inverse of E modulo phi of N. But how do we find phi of N? That's the key. Phi of N it's hard to find. But then you have to find it when you're setting up the R. You're right. When I set it up, I know everything. So there is a question of privacy here, real privacy. If I set it up RSA, can I decode everyone's messages? Right? Because I know everything, P and Q. So there's some sort of, that's how, if you, if you heard of this NSA scandal a few years ago, they put a backdoor into the protocol, so they saved those keys that were generated. So once I have the generated keys, I don't need to break it mathematically. I just know everything. I know the primes. I know few of them. I know everything. So whatever you encode, I can, I can debate. <laughs> Apart from those con concerns, how do I generate keys that only, uh, only the user knows, not me? Um, it's like the same like with root administrators, right? In any department, in any institution, there is a root administrator, right? that root administrator typically have access to everything. So how do you trust that your emails, for example, through Gmail or Hotmail or, or Yahoo, the administrators at Gmail have root access so they could see everyone's emails, right? It's the same problem. How do you design an institution so that the people who set it up, the administrators, you have to trust them to some degree, right? That they're not gonna look through my emails. <laughs> how would you set it up in the first place if you don't know the pay event? Like, how do you find that? Right, but so how do I set this up? How did I come up with 77? That's what he's asking. Well, how do you come up with the event? Like, you could just pick 77. Right. Good question. How do I come up with, fear? what's the first step? That's what he's asking, okay, if I get all these, I could work, right? Everybody believes me that if I have N, the factors, P of N, the E and D, everything would work. Everybody agrees with that? Hands up. So I can see that. Very good. Now, where do I start? How do I initiate this process? I would like to add here that D60 again has been computed at 7 minus 1 times 11 minus 1. That is a piece of magic that I didn't tell you yet, but you can believe me for now. That's how it's computed. It's not counting the co-primes. I can get it from 7 times 11. How do you know to use 7 and 11? Right. So how, what's the first step? Uh, I know you know the answer. Uh, I would like to give somebody else a chance, and you get the second chance if they get it wrong. Somebody else. How do I start? How do I initiate this process? Yes? Find the prime factors of n. So pick an n. That's the first thing. Pick an n, and then find the p and q, the prime factors. <laughs> I would say there's a better way to do that. What you're saying is correct. If I pick an N and get the factor 711, I could do the whole thing in the setup. But what would be the right way to start? Pick primes as like factors. Pick P and Q. Is that what you wanted to say? Yes. Right. So the first step in this whole setup, what is step number one? <coughs> step one. What do I do first? Choose two prime numbers. Choose P and Q primes. So then, in here, what did I choose? Which one did I choose in, in this example? Seven and Q is 11. Those are the two primes I chose for this example. So now, can everybody follow the process? If I have P and Q, how do I get N? More 
I multiply them. How do I get phi of n? <coughs> Who's phi of n? <coughs> it's p minus 1 times q minus 1. I know this is still magic. How come if n is a product of p and q, phi of n is p minus 1 times q minus 1? Of course, we'll get there. We'll prove that it's a theorem. Very easy to prove. No, no, no big deal. Again, the first step is get p and q. Second step, get n. Third step, get phi of n. Fourth step is choose an e that has to be co-prime with phi of n. So is this 60? Can I choose e to be 15? It has to be co-prime with phi of n. So let's, let's write down these steps. Uh, I think that's a question. What? How do you choose the E? Because if you have to test all the factors, it comes with the same problem. Right, right. So let's, let's get the steps, RSA steps. For setup, this is not the encryption decryption. It's how do you set it up. Step one, what did we say? Choose P and Q primes. I should say you want the one you want them to be large because if they are small, like how how far is to find P and Q if I tell you seventy seven? It's quite easy, right? Yes. Um, how do you tell that they're fine if they're so large? That's a very good question. So we have a a theorem for that Fermat's theorem that will solve that problem. We didn't get there yet. I know some of you think faster than me. But we got to, you know, little by little get it. Good question. How do I find a large prime number? Because it's easy 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, but what if it has like 3,000 digits? How do I know it's prime? Yes? Could you choose more than two primes to encrypt it to make it right. harder? Right. The, 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 the whole thing here does not rely, if you look at my RSA, doesn't have to be necessarily P times Q. Maybe it's P times Q times R times T. But it's the same hardness. There's no point doing that because breaking that, it's not harder than breaking P times Q. Because you're saying factorization into three or four factors, maybe it's harder than into two. That's not the case. When you factorize a number, the hardest factorization is the first one. When you have a large number, the hardest <laughs> part is to break it into a product of two things. Now, if you could do that, Breaking each product further into products, it's easier because they are smaller, right? If I take uh, 143, it's 11 times 13. That's the hard part. Once I have those factors, they are smaller. Breaking them into factors, now it's easier. So the hardest factorization is the first one, which means that's the key <coughs> for breaking RSA. There's no point putting more factors. I mean, you can. The equation would work, but there's no advantage to it. Okay? So what are the steps? Step two is compute n. Step three is P of n is who? P minus one. Okay? Step four is choose E. How, what's the property of E? E such that the GCD of E and who? It has to be co-prime with who? P of n. So then I can say calculate next step D, which is what? The inverse of E mod P of N. That's the part I don't like about this P of N. I have to use it in modulo and I get confused between when it's modulo P of N and when it's N. Because the RSA encryption decryption works modulo n, but the setup is modulo phi of n. So I could replace steps 4 and 5. I could say, you know, the whole steps 4 and 5, it's equivalent to saying as one step, choose somehow E and D such that, what do I need? E times D to be phi of n times something plus 1. So that's what I need. I need an E and D pair that are inverse to each other modulo phi of n, which means E times D is phi of n times an integer plus 1. I can choose E first and then compute the D, or I could do what? 
what could I do to still get E and D pair that does this? I can choose D first and then calculate E. <coughs> Yes. But either way, doesn't doesn't that involve you doing factorization, which is the problem in the first place that takes too long? So that, the answer is no. But even if it would, I already have the factors. Yeah, I mean for e, it's like if you want to see if e and b of n are co-prime, you have to factor out e and b of n. Uh, so how do I choose an e? That's the question, right? Yes. Right. Choosing. For, I can choose several ones and then I have to verify that this is true until I find one. <coughs> but finding the GCD, it's actually a fast operation through Euclid. Right. If I use Euclid for GCD's calculations or inverses, <coughs> it spares me the factorization. That's a very important point. With Euclid algorithms, and even with the racing at the power method that I gave you, if you race intelligently with the squaring and squaring and squaring again, you get to the inverse without factorization. Factorization being the Achilles heel of number theory. Every time you need factorization, we're in trouble because that's a hard problem. But we can compute all these with GC with Euclid algorithms. So you just get some tracking so you get a good e? Right. Not necessarily, but that's a one way, one reasonable way to do it. The phi of n would be so large that a lot of numbers would be relatively prime easily. So you don't need to try many values. E it's usually a small number like three or five or seven because it's public and everyone knows it and everyone needs to encode things easily. D is usually a big number, the inverse of E. That's hard to find. Okay. So then uh, I'm ready, right? Then I'm ready for encryption decryption. How does that work? Again, any message I have, I raise it at the public key, modulo n. Whoever gets this needs to raise it at d, d is secret, so only the people who have d can decode this message. I get back x, and that's guaranteed by the RSA equation, which is this one. If e, d have satisfied this mathematical property, when you do x at e, then at d, you're guaranteed to get back x. How large are the numbers usually? Usually 600 digits in base 10, which is two, currently 2048 digits in base 2. So that means those numbers, imagine a number that has 600 digits, it wouldn't fit on this board, right? We'll go all the way outside with it. So, that's, so they wouldn't use 64 bit? No, 2048 bit. <laughs> right. And that has to be increased. The more computational power we have, the more we can brute force attack those numbers. So within three years, it will be 4,000 bits. And within, the more we get computation, people evaluate this, saying, how much it would take to brute force attack a prime number of 2,000 bits? 10 years. So within five years, they increase it to double. So you know, the compute, even if you add up the computation in the world, it's hard to brute force this operation. Unless somebody comes up with a very intelligent algorithm to factorize things. Because remember, n is known. If you could come up with an efficient algorithm for factorization to obtain p and q, that would be easy. Because once I have p and q, everything is. Once I have p and q, I get p of n. And since e is known, the inverse module of e of n with GCD extended Euclid algorithm, fast algorithm, even if I have 4,000 bits or 2,000 bits, Euclid algorithm will finish in a day. But I need phi of n for that. And for phi of n, I need what? The factors p and q. That's the RSA magic. It relies on the fundamental property that factorizing a number into large primes, I'm not talking about three times something. That's easy. Those being large primes, both of them with 2,000 bits. It's not easy to try different piece to find it. <coughs> if you try different piece to find the factor, it will take forever, even with a super fast computer. Okay? Uh, there is an entire theory in mathematics of why factorization is hard. And we don't have 
an exact mathematical answer to that question. We think it's high, and we already know that any basic technique relies on that theory or that theory or that theory will not work. But the fundamental question, is it any algorithm ever going to be able to factorize things efficiently? We don't yet have the definite answer to that. We know that all the algorithms people have tried and all theories people have tried will not work. But the question is, can somebody come up with a new theory, a new algorithm, out of a blue, totally new, that will factorize things efficiently? We're not sure. Now, everybody believes that's not possible. That's why everybody uses this encryption. The moment somebody comes up with such an algorithm, that would be the Armageddon of all banks and <laughs> encryptions all over the world. We don't think that is possible, okay? Is there like an alternate system that someone's come up with in case someone has broken it? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, we'll have to dig deeper into cryptography. There are other cryptographic systems, but this is by far the most popular because we don't think it's breakable. We think there's a mathematical hard property and extremely easy to implement. That's actually important. All these operations, even if I have very big numbers, can be done very fast. How do I do x at the power modulo n if those are really large numbers, n and e? How do I do that? Quick. I just do, but how do I raise at the power that has 2,000 bits? I do fast squaring, right? Fast squaring reduces the time to logarithmic. If even if I, E has 2,000 bits, that would be a huge number of operations, x to the E, right? But if I do it with fast squaring, like I showed you, you know, a week ago, that's OK. I can do that pretty fast. Within minutes, I can get x at E, if not seconds. Same thing here. All these operations can be done quite fast. So are they all O log n? What? Are they all O log n? <laughs> right. And log n, if it has. 2,000 bits is roughly 2,000. So 2,000 operations, not a big deal for even a phone to compute quickly. But e to the 2,000, which is the actual n, if I have to do that many, comp that, that will never work, right? So it's important to realize that this operation, this operation, and even the setup operations, the product, v of n, and the inverse could be done quite fast, even though the numbers are very big. So this I do, how do I compute the inverse with extended? Okay. That is RSA. Uh, and we're going to do a little more. Uh, we're going to add a row here that we're going to talk about next time, which is. Um, <coughs> which is how signatures work. So if I want to have an RSA signature verification, I have Alice here and Bob here. Now, they don't just want to encrypt and decrypt stuff. They want to use RSA. But they also want to verify that the message comes from Alice. See, the original RSA, if somebody sends me a message, I get to decrypt it, I get the message. But I'm not sure who sent it, right? <coughs> who sent this message? Anyone could have encrypted this message. Anyone could have, because E and N are public, anyone can do it. What if I want to know for sure who encrypted this message? Remember, in, even in emails now, we get signatures, right? So how do signatures work? How can we tell? How to verify certificates? We need to verify the authority. We need to know the other person on the other side. It's certainly Alice or whoever, right? So Alice here, it's going to have the Alice. That's the private key of Alice, the public key of Alice. <coughs> Uh, it has its own modulo, so it has its own n. Um, and it also has the public key of Bob and the n of Bob. So Alice and Bob use different n's 
Alice might use n equals 77, and Bob, let's say n equals 77, that's n for Alice, and Bob uses a different n, 143, that's n Bob. So Bob, of course, has its private key, has its public key, has the its own n, it also has the public information for Alice. In fact, everyone has the public information. This stuff is public. And this stuff is public. They have different keys with different ends, an E, a D, an N, so on and so forth. So what Alice does, it encrypts a message twice. The first one is the message and its signature. It adds this, 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 this thing to the message Alice. That is its own you know, signature. It does it at the public key of B and encrypts again X with its own key. That's a little funny. Why would I use my own encryption for a key? And now what Bob does, it can recover X Alice by doing Y1. What power Bob needs here to decrypt this message? So this is modulo NB and this is modulo NA. This needs to be at DB modulo NB and then to get X alone, I need to do Y2 <coughs> at EA modulo NA. Observe that Alice has all this information that's needed. It has the BA, it has the EB, it has the NB and NA. And Bob has this information, has its own private key, has the ends, of course, both of them, and has the public key of Alice. Now, how does now Bob can recognize that Alice sent this message? He looks at X, Alice versus X. If I remove Alice and I get the same message, I know for sure. So the trick is that X <coughs> plus Alice, that's the verification, gives me X Alice. If that's true, then I verify that the sender is Alice, not somebody else. Nobody else, that's your exercise for next time. Nobody else could have sent those two messages Y1 and Y2 that when decrypted show some message, whatever the message is, you know, my military will attack tomorrow. That's the encrypted <laughs> message that I don't want people to find out, right? And then the signature of Alice. If I get those two to align, I not only decrypted the message, but I did verify that the sender must be Alice. That's important for signatures. I not only want to decrypt the message, but I know I don't know for sure who sent it, right? In military, if I decrypt a message, what if my enemy somehow sends me weird messages to confuse me, right? I need to know where this message came from, right? Anybody can encrypt messages to confuse me, but I need to know for sure who encrypted this message. So next time, we're going to look a little bit more at those signatures, how they work and why they work. But it's quite easy with different keys to verify that the sender is the right person. Yes? How does Bob know to use E of A to decrypt that one? He, he gets two messages. The first one, it decrypts with his private key. The second one decrypts to E of A. He be, no, I know who the sender is supposed to be. Okay, but how do you know that? Right, so I'm supposed to get my message from, you know, the Pacific Command from, you know, I know who the message is supposed to come from. In an email, I see the, the email, you know, it's coming from you. But I need to know that it's really coming from you mathematically. So it's not like I need, I don't know who the sender is supposed to be. That's what you're asking. I know who's supposed to be, but I need to verify mathematically to know for sure that nobody is pretending to be you. In a military case, it's easy to send messages to confuse the other side. 
but you know who the messages are supposed to come from, and you can check the public key to see if that works out. Yes? So uh, when you said X, you, it's, it, it can be like a secret. I mean, yeah, it can be a secret message because you can easily decrypt it with the public key. Like, this, you mean? Yeah. Right. So it's a little bit more to the signatures. She is right. What? I can't just find a message like that. Who can do this? Whoever knows E of A can do this, right? So we need to establish some sort of protocol. What do we send and what do we receive? It, it, it doesn't finish here, right? We have to say, okay, we have to send some message to verify the signature and then to send another message that's encrypted somewhere, right? I want to leave it at that for now because we don't, we need to do something for your homework. But then next time, I, that's why I leave it as an exercise. How is this stuff going to work for me? And next time, we'll, we'll, we'll build those signatures right here. So there is, let's be honest and leave this side open here, you know, how this stuff actually works. This is mathematically how it works, but how do I put it in practice? What we need to do now is to finish for good the other track. That's right here. This DCD, remember? The Euclid algorithm. So let me uh, do another example. We, we've done one uh, last time, and I want to do another one. Uh, so extended Euclid. Do you guys remember how that worked? Let's take an A equal 51. B equal 9. Uh, what's the, first, we do the Euclid part, but we need to leave a lot of side on the right side because we're going to do these coefficients. But the Euclid part is whose Q, when I divide 51 by 9, 5, five. and whose I, 6. So who's next in Euclid? Nine, six, six. The division. How many sixes are in nine? One. And R is three. And then A equal six. B equal three. Q equal two. R equal zero. That means stop. And who's the GCD? The last B. That's the Euclid algorithm, right? Finds the GCD for me. By keep moving AB into BR, again into BR, again into BR. You can think of these are recursive calls. This is the code, the original call, call zero. I could procedure if I write a computer program, right? I call this up, but this procedure calls itself again. It's a recursive call. But instead of AB, it calls for BR. And then that procedure calls two. That's why in my notes you see this in, in indentation. It says that this procedure, it's kind of the pattern procedure, and this one is in between, and this one is in between. In computer science, that means this procedure calls this procedure, and this one calls this one. So the return, the finishing procedure is backward. This one has to finish first. Then this one finishes, then that one finishes. If you ever wrote a recursive call, when it calls itself a few times until it ends, the last call finishes first, and then the next to last call finishes second last, and so on and so forth, until the last one finishes. In the case of GCD, we don't need to worry too much about finishing calls because the GCD is, whenever it's done, that's it. That's the GCD, we're done. But if we want to compute X and Y, we could compute x and y right here. When, when this stops, it's easy to compute x and y. x is 0, y is 1. Let's uh, verify that. How do we verify? ax plus by is what? a times x is 0. b times y is 3. Is 3 the GCD? Good. 
So this is the verified. The only mistakes I've seen on GCD Euclid algorithm, extended Euclid, which is a little tedious to compute, are on this column verified. Remember this from me, if your verified column is correct, the whole extended Euclid is correct. Don't skip that column, please. Because the mistakes are going to be in here. You're going to see the mistake here if you make a mistake. If this is correct, your extended Euclid works. Assuming the GCD is correct, that is, you got the right GCD. So the question is, how do we compute x and y when we go back to the, from the second call to the first call? There's, there's some magic formula there. This x is the previous y. So this x is 1. And there is a formula here. The formula here is uh, previous x minus q times previous y, meaning those guys. So this in here, x is previous y. So that is 1. Let me do this. So how do I do this? Previous x is 0, right? <coughs> minus q. Who's the q on this line? 1 times the previous y, that's 1. So how much is this? Negative 1. Always verify. Maybe we made a mistake. No shame in mistakes, OK? The shame is submitting the wrong paper in the end, not making a mistake that we can verify. How much is in this line, ax plus by? ax is 9 <coughs> minus, this is q. So that's 9 minus 6 is 3. It's always 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, because the GCD did not change. The GCD on this line, same as GCD, same as GCD here. So it's always that. Okay. So we go up one more level. What is this x? Previous y. So who's the previous y? Negative 1. And who's now this y? Is the previous x, which is 1, minus q times previous y. Who's q? 5, previous y is? So minus 5 times minus 1, right? How much is this? 7. Maybe we made a mistake again. I made mistakes all the time on this stuff. I'm honest with you. So I, when I wrote these notes, I probably mistaken these equations like three or four times. But the verification saved me out. So what do I get here? It's 51, 8 times? Minus 51, right? 8 times minus 1. Uh, what do we get? 1 minus 6. That's 6, right? It was intentional, so you can show us that the verified I'm human too, OK? 6 times 9 is? So this gives me a? So what are my final coefficients that I'm outputting here? That now that I'm done, who is my answer? What are the final coefficients? Minus 1. And y is? Now remember, those are not unique. You and your friend might get different coefficients. That's totally fine. The reason they're not unique is this is not the only pair that works at the, at the, at the, when you finish. I could have a different one, for example, uh, 1 and 1 minus 2, or something like that. And also, these equations, previous y and x minus q minus previous y, that's also not the only way to go up. But that's the easiest way, and you're going to get those coefficients. Any set of coefficients that work are good. They're not unique. Uh, so there's plenty of more examples of Euclid algorithm in the notes. And tomorrow and Thursday at recitation, you're going to have all recitations extended Euclid's to make mistakes just like me. The savior here is what? What saves us? This column. If you have this column, you're going to get it right. Okay?
So don't exclude that column. You got absolutely must have the verify column in there. So now I have a little theorem. So this is the answer. of GCD, it's called generator, but we don't worry about the name. Uh, what this theorem is saying, I have two sets that are the same. One set is AX plus BY for any X and Y integers. That is all possibilities of AX plus BY. Not just X and Y given by GCD. But any linear, we call this a linear combination. In A and B. So linear combination means A times something plus B times something. And because we work with integers, the something's got to be integer numbers. This is a set of infinitely many values, right? I could get in here all kinds of things. Because every time I plug an X and Y, I could get different values. Sometimes I repeat values, because like I said, I can get different coefficients to give me the same value. But it's an infinite set, for sure. This is the set of multiples of GCD of AB. Uh, so let's, let's call that GCD, let's call it D. So what are the multiples of GCD? 0 is, of course, a multiple, D. Right. D, 2D, 3D, all the way to <coughs> infinity. What about on the other side? What are the multiples of D on the negative side? Minus D, minus 2D all the way to all the negative. <coughs> what this theorem is saying is those two sets are the same set. In other words, how do we prove that two sets are the same? There are two proofs. So first, we have to prove this way. We want to prove any element in here is also in here. <coughs> so the first proof is for any x, y, integers, AX plus BY is a multiple <coughs> of GCD. Right? That's saying any way you pick an X and Y, you get the multiple of GCD. Obvious proof, right? Why is that? I mean, that, that's a very simple thing. GCD Let's say D, because we call it D. D divides A, right? Because <laughs> it's GCD. It's the common factor between A and B. So D divides A. D divides B. Implies D going to divide AX plus BY. Is that, is that true? So we can say D divides A implies D divides A times X. And D divides B implies D divides B times Y, right? Because if it's a division of A, when I multiply it with something, it's still a multiple of B. So from this implies D divides AX plus <coughs> BY. Are you guys following me? Any number, GCD prime, whatever, that divides A and B is going to divide the linear combination between them. Because it divides this chunk, this <coughs> chunk, so it also divides the sum or the difference between them. So it's going to divide the GCD. Therefore, it's going to be a multiple of D. Any, any, again, any combination I pick in this set is going to end up being a multiple of D. But there is a second part of this proof, which is the other way. The other way. How do I do it the other way? Any multiple of D. say d times k can be written as a combination here, right? So for any multiple of d, that is whatever k you pick here, then how do we say this? There is an x and y such that ax plus by is dk. Anyway, 
you pick a multiple of D, there are some coefficients that gives you that multiple. Also obvious. Once we know this. The reason is we just found those magic coefficients that gives me exactly D. So I have a specific X and Y that gives me D. How do I make another X and Y that gives me D times K now? In other words, if I have X and Y, so X and Y, I call it say X0 and Y0 are the GCD coefficients. Uh, so what they satisfy? A X0 plus B Y0, that's a very special, they give me D. Well, how do I find out X and Y who get DK? Like for K equal three. If I give you these coefficients, can you give me some coefficients that will give me three times D? Three Multiply them by three, right? So if that's true, I take X equal K times X zero and Y equal K times Y zero. So now AX plus BY is gonna be K times D. If I have the coefficients to get D, I can get any multiples of D by multiplying those coefficients with two or three or minus two or minus five or minus 100, and I get any multiple of D. So again, a quick recap. Any combination we pick got to be a multiple of the GCD. And any multiple of the GCD, it can be written as a combination, which means those two sets are the same set. That's finishing completely that track over there. This is a tool track for us because we don't develop a theory. What we do, we use it to find quick inverses. This is an extremely efficient algorithm, more efficient than the one with the powers I showed in the beginning. So if you really need an inverse, modulo 60 or modulo 75 or modulo 140, the faster way to get the inverse is this, especially on paper. With a calculator, we can implement the P of A, the powers of A, very fast. And we can work it kind of the same computational time. But on paper, GCD, unbeatable at getting you the inverse. You get those coefficients, make sure you get this color. And the moment you got that, X is the inverse of A modulo B, Y is the inverse of A, um, inverse of B modulo A. Now, this is a tool track for us because we use it just to get stuff out. There's an entire theory that shows that building on this GCD, we can show axiomatic theorems like unique factorizations and other things. So in number theory, this plays a much bigger role than what it plays for us. For us, it's just a screwdriver. We need to screw you know, the screws with it, which is find the inverse. That is our main problem that we solve with the GCD extended algorithm. For us, this other track is the main track, the one with the P of N. P of N is absolutely necessary to get the RSA to work. So now, in the last uh, few minutes, I would like to uh, show you some stuff online, on my computer. Assuming I can get things to work the way I want. Assume that's gonna happen. I don't know how the camera is going to record this. Uh, so first of all, I would like to point out the website. I, I hope everyone found the website by now. If you don't find this website, you live in the regular section, okay? <laughs> you gotta find this website to be in the other section, because that, that, that's what the difference is, okay? <laughs> and in particular, what do we have here? Did anybody click on this link that says number theory? Yes. yes. Okay. So, the book doesn't help us at all. The book is a nice story for people who are still in the seventh grade and they can't really make progress in mathematics, okay? Is it the absolute minimum to give the homework done? Yes. Can you get an A with the book and the trivial homework that we give you? Yes. We also, you just wasted your time if you do that. So do not waste your time, please, ignore the book. <laughs> Including where it says table method, 
and proofs and all that, they're not very mathematical. This is as mathematical as we can go. So these are the notes you should read. Um, so what do we have here? A bunch of theorems, blah, 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 blah. And, um, and here's Euclid, and here's some stuff we did in class. And then uh, here is the theorem that we keep coming at it, right? Inverse, that's the theorem, that's the set P of A. And this is explains how to compute P of A here. And then we get extended Euclid with few examples. Uh, and then we have there's examples for extended Euclid. And here's the set of co-primes, the factorization into P of A times Q of A, like we did in class. More examples of how that works. This is the three-step proof that I mentioned. We need the first two steps. Oops, a little too far. We need the first two steps to prove the sets are equal, and the third step to prove that those products are not repeating values. Out of there, we get Euler's theorem. A of P of N is one. There is another proof of Euler's theorem here, just in case you don't like that one. There's one more involved with uh, number theory here. This is optional. Once you learn the first proof, you don't need the second one. And finally, what we didn't have time today, but we're going to pick up, is to particular cases of P of N. For example, we mentioned last time, what if N is prime? Right? If N is prime, who is P of N? What are the co-primes with the prime number? All except zero. So how many co-primes are in Zn if n is prime? N minus one, n minus one co-primes, right? So if I would use n prime, why do I use n equal p times q for RSA? Why can't I say pick a prime, pick a large prime number, 307? What's the problem with that? If I make n public, 307? No, it's prime. So we don't need to factorize it. What's the issue? Why could I do RSA with the prime number alone? Finding C would be much more difficult. Much more easy. For a prime number, if n is 3 or 7 prime, what is P of n? 3 or 6. So then once I have P of n, it's done. But with the product, P times Q, not so easy to find P of n. So the reason we don't use a prime for n is that finding P of n would be very easy. So we use P times Q. Now, in P times Q, we're going to show next time the P of N is this. And we can do other examples of, say, P times Q times R, or P squared times Q. What is P of N for all these things? <coughs> I noticed the question. Let me finish in here. Uh, this is answering the question, how do I find a large prime? <laughs> Essentially, I pick a large number, and I verify it's prime or not. That's how I pick. I, I find prime numbers. And sometimes I'm wrong. This verification is not always <coughs> correct. Most of the time it's correct. But sometimes I pass prime numbers, but they are not really prime. I want to show you one more thing that you are expected to do for this recitation last week. I think I sent an email. There is a page here that says proofs. Whoever didn't do this page last week, is expected to do it at home and bring it to the recitation so the TAs can look at it because we need to do some practice on proof. There's no additional grading or participation or nothing, but I need you guys to try those three proofs. So tomorrow and Thursday, bring me that page so we can see where we have the proofs. There was a question? I was going to say, why don't you try to We, we can look at that they're so large that any message would be smaller than them anyway. One more thing. I have an amazing piece of code here written by Professor Aslam, who does uh, Euclidean <coughs> for two numbers. I could do 80 and 56, boom, gives me the whole thing. Imagine how this would be to solve the whole more questions. It gives me A, B, Q, R, X, and Y. Easy peasy. Can we make our Actually, I'm asking you to. There is an extra credit question to implement extended Euclid. 
So he did it in two ways. There is uh, this table program, and there is another one who gives uh, more mathematical aspects of verification, implemented externally in Euclid. And um, if we look at this, these programs, you can implement it in two ways. So in one way, uh, here, this is implemented non-recursively. It's still GCD, but it's not calling itself. It finds a way to avoid recursive calls. We're going to talk about that Friday. And this other one here is the one that does recursive calls. So you can easily say, here's a procedure, extended the Euclid. And you can tell at some point it calls itself right here. That's definitely a recursive call. So recursive, it's easy to see because I'm just calling the procedure for VNR. But I have a question for you. How would you implement this algorithm non-recursively without calling itself? That's this other version that needs a for loop or something like that. This is in Perl as a language, but you can implement it in MATLAB or Python or Java, or whatever you find convenient. In this class, whatever language you choose. <laughs> The attendance sheet, please. I don't have a deadline. I like to just go by the people. If you care about it, you know, but I don't want to deal with it. I did front squats and deadlifts before I came here. Sitting there just killed my back. Also, I'm probably going to be in the camera still on. I better be in this video. There's no points for me. Whatever language you choose is fine. As long as we can understand what's going on. Maybe you pick a language that we have no clue what it does. So I wouldn't pick a functional language, but you could. I would pick a more like MATLAB or Python. Yes, I My question was like, when it comes to like doing groups and stuff, I just get really confused. That's why I really want you guys to do those three groups so we can look at them tomorrow or Thursday. But like, if I can't. I mean, like I did, for example, on the written homework. There's one. I just wrote like a paragraph, and I don't know. No, no. You're so. gonna if you do that, you're gonna lose points because, okay. again, 